Welcome to Vibe, everybody. Vibe Book and Music Shop in Moi Wo on Lantau Island in Hong Kong. Um, so today we're pleased to um, present Mr. Ludlow here, Martin Ludlow. Martin was born in South Wales in 1959 and joined the financial services industry in 1984. He enjoyed a career of both management and financial advisor. Martin's speciality is in providing bespoke financial advice to further net worth clients. His clients, <laughs> not reading this very well, am I? Uh, his clients li live throughout Asia, the UK, Europe, and the Middle East. Martin now lives in Hong Kong, representing St. James Wealth Management. An avid student of personal development, Martin has spoken all over the world, including Chicago, Hong Kong, Zimbabwe, Vienna, Salzburg, and Monte Carlo. Currently enjoying some stand-up comedy for charity and now published author with his second book well on its way. To tell you the story behind Porridge with Honey, please welcome Martin Ludlow. Thanks Gary. This is very different to the last time I spoke. Very different experience. I was MC at the Hong Kong National Chess Championships. And uh, it was fantastic. They, they made a big effort. They didn't have the red carpet going in. They had the black and white Czech carpet going in. <laughs> they had um, beautiful statuesque figurines of chess pieces in black and white everywhere. The servers wore black and white shirts with matching aprons. And even the tablecloths had black and white Czech. The trouble is they sat me next to the champion and it took him 20 minutes to pass the salt. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <coughs> so... Today I've got a little story for you and a challenge, and a personal challenge, and I hope that at least half of you are up for it. Welcome Joe, you, you missed the joke. <laughs> <coughs> <Probably heading. laughs> you were in it. So, have you thought about your, your legacy and what you might leave, and I don't just mean the money or the assets, and I'm in that business, but what about the memories and the thoughts and everything that's gone on? And I think a book is a lovely way of doing it because uh, children want to learn about their grandparents and their parents, and I certainly want to learn more about mine, and this is a great way to pass it down. So let's go and let's get started. <coughs> oh, before we do, if you don't want to leave a legacy, hello, who says? <laughs> Coming in, buddy. Have you just done a bank job or something? No, I'm, I'm about to. <laughs> so, so if you don't want to leave a legacy and you don't want to write a book, then uh, there may be something else in the book for you because Gary's going to read a, a really nice review I had from somebody I don't know. He put this review on Amazon. And again, I haven't been <coughs> first this, so this is going to sound quite red. Uh, so Martin's aim was to leave a legacy for his granddaughters. The reality was a roadmap to a happy and successful life for us all. As soon as the book arrived, I picked it up for a flick through the pages. By the time I put it down, I was finished. A number of hours later, I was enthralled. The life lessons and simple but poignant reminders of how to be the best version of yourself every day kept me gripped throughout. From an outsider's view, I would be incredibly proud to leave my own grandchildren such a legacy. Martin's book has rekindled my own focus and I'm sure it will do the same and more for his granddaughters. A favourite quote of mine and one I'm sure Willie, grandfather in the book, was his outdoor influences, would have appreciated. What is a legacy? It's planting a seed in a garden you never get to see. I have no doubt Martin's legacy will bloom and grow in the minds of both his granddaughters and anyone reading it. One person found this helpful, and this is from Rhys Morgan in the UK. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Rhys. Love to meet you one day. I really don't know that guy, but it was, a, it was really nice. So here's a quick summary of what we're going to talk about in the short time available. How did this book come about? Who's in it and why? Uh, your book, if that's possible. And I'm going to show you a way how you can do that, even if you don't have the time. And the byproducts of uh, writing a book. And then if there's time at the end and you're interested, I'll give you my next steps and more, and more I might do. Because uh, that should be a bit of fun. So, <coughs> why porridge with them? Well, now I'm a granddad. And I'm not just any old granddad. 
according to my granddaughters, I am Grandad Honky Conky. So I got a title and I'm very proud of it. You know, there's loads of granddads out there, but I don't know any other Grandad Honky Conky. So <coughs> that's good. Now, in the book, I tell them a little bit about Merthyr, a little bit about my grandparents, and then I bring in the big guns, all the people who have inspired me, because that's the big message I want to give to Skylar, Chanel, and Tiana. I want them to learn from people much better than me, from science to comedy to music, right through, and they get to know all of what inspired me in my era, which I hope uh, they keep with them. But I will tell you a little bit about Merthyr. Um, Merthyr's not quite the end of the universe, but you can see it from there. <coughs> I don't know if you're aware, but in Merthyr, you can get a pie, a pint, and a woman for three pounds seventy-five. There, there's not much meat in the pie, though. <coughs> and Merthyr is famous, in particular, for breeding strong character in women. And I know that because when I was fourteen, I can remember coming home to my grandmother Nanny and saying, "Nanny, this is my girlfriend. What do you think?" And Nanny looked her up and down, and she said, "Couldn't you do any better?" I said, "Nanny, don't say that. I love her." She said, "I'm talking to her." <laughs> And that's what it's like in Merthyr. But this is, as is sort of, um, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> excuse me. So while we're uh, talking about the book, um, and in particular, what was going to happen, I was going to write this in calligraphy. And I contacted my daughter-in-law and said, Shara, I'm going to write a book to the girls, and I'm going to write it in calligraphy. And she said, that's a great idea. So I bought the pens listened to the YouTube videos. I bought the moleskin covered plain book to fill this in. And the book was going to be written in my handwriting. And I failed miserably. I don't know if you've tried calligraphy. Some of you look creative to me, but I still got the pens. I still got the courses. I still got everything. And it never got off the ground. So I thought the book's dead in the bin. It's gone. And then uh, I had a bit of a call to action. <clears throat> I was determined to write the book. And at this point, I was beginning to quit. And then I was diagnosed with cancer, first time, and that changed everything. So I thought, now I've got to write this book. I've been messing around for 18 months with this calligraphy. That's not going to happen. I put the pens away, and I contacted a publisher, and I said, give me a price for 14 books. I don't want to sell the book. And I said, I got the title. I got everything right. I just want the price for the books. And they gave me the price, and we agreed. And then I thought, I'm quitting here. I'm failing. And I was pretty sick. And then I was reminded of a poem, which I love, being a Welshman. And this was an inspirational poem I've used on the speaker circuit, building big teams, and certainly to help inspire me. And it's a brilliant poem, which I'm going to read to you, from uh, <coughs> uh, Whittier, who died in 1892, so he's older than Nate. <laughs> M maybe not, maybe not. Nate is going on a bit. He, he can remember when the Dead Sea was sick. <laughs> when Burger King was a prince. <laughs> so, when things go wrong as they sometimes will, and the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, Though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Because often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. <clears throat> often the struggle has given up when he might have captured the victim's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to that golden crown. Because success is failure turned inside out. That silver glint on the cloud of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may seem near when it's really far. So stick to the guns, your guns, when you're hardest hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. And I loved that. And at that point, it gave me a kick up the butt, which I desperately needed. <coughs> and I got a plan together. So the plan came together and I thought, right, I got the chapters. I know what I want to bring into this book. And some of the people I brought into the book were uh, Spike Milligan. I love comedy. I've got a wacky sense of humour, as you all know. Uh, Muhammad Ali, Einstein, Newton, Tony Robbins, and my favourite, the guy that in influenced me the most in the 80s, was um, 
Dennis Waitley. Dr. Dennis Waitley was an astronaut and physicist. He trained Olympic champions to the gold, gold medals uh, with the rifle shooters. He taught them to slow their heartbeat down as he thought it was the only way to hit the bullseye. So he features quite a lot in, <coughs> in my training. Now, let me tell you an, another interesting thing that's happened. As we, uh, hi. Don't underestimate how much your children and grandchildren want to know about your life. We have lived in a totally different era to them. If we could just go back 15 years, we didn't have smartphones. And now they run our lives. And uh, my daughter-in-law did something really nice. When I sent the books to them about a month ago to Dubai, as the girls opened the books, uh, they didn't know what they were opening. And my son sent me the video of this, which I still watch. And the girls opened the books and they saw the photograph on the, on the thing. And a couple of pages in, there's a scary one of me. And they were going up to the people in the hotel, the server, saying, we got a book. This is my granddad, Onky Conky. He's written the book. And they were very proud to show off their book. And that meant a lot. That's a memory that, that I'll keep. And the other thing that happened, um, Shara started reading them bits from the book in bed. And uh, I've got a sister, Teresa. The girls call her Auntie Tweez. And they love her. And she loves them. And while she was reading it, uh, my eldest granddaughter, Skylar, said, Mum... Was Grandad Onky Conky and Auntie Tweez ever young like us? <laughs> and that's so innocent and so nice, but it's, it's, it's really lovely. So it makes you think. So I would challenge you to consider writing a book. Uh, there are byproducts. Everybody's got a book in them. I didn't think I would do this. I can now call myself a published author, and it feels lovely. I wouldn't have said that a couple of years ago. But you can all do this, definitely. And if you haven't got time, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, one of my buddies is in the audience right now, and he's got a book in him, definitely. That guy's got stories that I don't want my granddaughters to read about. <laughs> I mean, <coughs> and he's got a, you know, he likes his glass of wine. In fact, if, uh, if alcohol did its tax returns, Jack would be listed as a dependent. <laughs> <coughs> but Jack has had a really interesting life. And uh, we were talking one night over a glass of wine, or was it a bottle? And, <laughs> and he started telling me things about his life and whatever. And I was oh, no, 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 Jack. People think I know you, you know. And then he said, I'm going to do the book. Because I, I was partly inspired to write the book by Simon, who is an award-winning author. His book is here somewhere, The Bond. Uh, and Simon has given me a lot of encouragement because he's written a book that's won awards. It's been published in different languages. I'd love to achieve that. But... Um, <coughs> Jack and I were talking, and I said, you're not going to write this book, are you, Jack? I said, your day's going to evolve and, you know, go down the bar and take your clients out to lunch and live the playboy lifestyle. And uh, he said, uh, you may be right, but no, 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 I'm an eternal optimist. I'm going to write the book. I said, there's only one way this book is going to get done, and I want you to remember this. I said, Jack, I'm going to interview you. I'm going to ask you the questions. And just like I used to teach the guys in personal development, I'm going to bring in my seven buddies. He said, who are they? And I said, I have seven friends, you know them well, called who, what, why, where, how and when. And those are the questions. So Jack, here's some questions for the book. Why did they kick you out of the Gestapo? What was it like? What was it like? Who was with you? Why? When? When did this happen? And that's all you need. And I tell you, I'm looking at some of you now who I've had some great times with you, my neighbours. And there's definitely a book in all of you, definitely. And if I can help, or, or grab somebody else you know and trust and get them to ask you the questions and you've got your book, even if you've got no time. And that's the challenge. So on with the story. <coughs> Am I on the right page? So there are some byproducts, I think. Um, in business, being a published author in this short time has already helped me. I'm getting really nice remarks. People do respect authors. And I don't think I'm, I'm a special author, but wait till you get the next book. But, um, but people like Simon. I, I, I've lost count how many hours I've spent with him in his home, with his wine, and with his wife cooking for us. And he's helping me for nothing. He's help Other people here, this place in particular, this venue has been fantastic. One of your recent speakers, um, Patrick, yeah. messaged me on LinkedIn and he said oh I see you've written a book 
He said, I'm coming to Muiwo soon. Let's exchange books. I'll give you mine, you give me yours. So I'm working with people that I admire and respect. And there's, the best way I could describe it is in this writing community, which is very new to me. Everybody seems to have like a, a confidence mixed with humility, but a genuine love of the game. And there's no egos, it's all fun, we're all together, all in the same boat. So I consider that if, if just for networking and improving things for you. The other thing that happened was uh, a few years ago I was in, uh, I took a project in France, south of France. So I worked in uh, Nice and Monaco and where all the playboys are and, and it was great, it really was great. And I put together, I had to penetrate these guys to get business, I had to get in, in that community. Now, if I get up and talk about money, it's, it can be quite boring. And even with a little bit of stand-up comedy under my belt, I still fail to make money sound funny. You know, it's difficult. So I put a little brand together called Health, Wealth and Wellbeing. And we started off where I got a, a German doctor who was also an author. And he would get up and talk about why we're going to live beyond 100. Then I would get up as the killjoy and say, well, that's great, but what if you run out of money when you're 70? And then we get somebody to talk about well-being. Well, I brought that program to Hong Kong and we've had local doctors from Hong Kong like Paul Murray, Susan Jameson, who have spoke for me as the doctor part at the beginning, then myself. And then we brought in um, Jill Marshall. Jill was, is an expert in um, yoga and Pilates. And uh, <coughs> what Jill does, she shows up at the, the talk, she's the third speaker, and she shows up in a leotard and mingles with the audience and talks about posture, relaxation techniques. And I've always wanted to work with a yoga teacher because Gary told me they bend over backwards for you. <coughs> and then she taught me how to meditate. And it's really good. It's better than sitting down doing nothing. <laughs> and the final speaker was then uh, Natalie Summer. Natalie's moved to Spain now, but she lived at the far end of the beach. And she's a relationship coach. So she used to talk about what happens when your relationship goes stale? How do you keep it alive? The zones of the body, who's attracted to who and so on. And everything was going well with Natalie until she started asking me questions. And she disappointed me because I really thought I was a fantastic lover, but she told me my ex had asthma. <laughs> so, <coughs> so <coughs> health, wealth and well-being is going. So what have I learned about writing the book? Well, there's quite a bit quite a bit I've learned. I think it's built me as a person. It's given me the bug to write another book along with other things. And even in the downtime, I mean, <coughs> Joe Lauder could tell you, I keep a little book like this at the side of my bed, don't I, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> with, with, with a pen. And I am, when I go to Central, in, invariably I wear a suit, so one of these goes in my pocket. And I'm always avid writing notes. And I strongly recommend you do that if you're going to do your book because there's a connection between your brain and your own handwriting, which is much better than the computer. You can put it on the computer later, but this is personal and this is you. And there's <coughs> something uh, relevant, I want to say, which I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but I was at the China Bear one night uh, with Sarah, and we were having a drink. <coughs> and we were, having, we, we were having a drink. And we were both on a little bit of a downer. So we were both crying in each other's beer and licking our wounds. And she kept asking me questions about cancer because it came back. And she thought I was dealing with it well. And I said, Sarah, you can do this, you can do that. And I am an eternal optimist. I get on my own nerves. You can do this, you can do that. And I said a phrase to her, which I forgot about. And when I got home, she texted me. And what I'd said to her was, Sarah, don't wait to get sick to get better. And she texted me that and I thought, wow, I didn't realize that had an impact. And that's something I would strongly recommend. So, <coughs> what's up next? I want to take you back to Monaco. And I'm sat, no, Nice. I'm sat outside Mar Nolan's bar with big Joe Kelly. And Joe's a big unit. He's a big Irish man. He's about 25 stone. Some of you know him. And I wouldn't want to take a thump off him. But Joe and I, to cut a long story short, we'd both been screwed in France and it was embarrassing and I'm coming back to Hong Kong I kept my home here I kept my job here and he's got to go to the UK and then we he starts telling me all stories about his upbringing in Belfast which is very interesting for me and he starts asking me all these questions about my upbringing which he found interesting I mean we we were very poor 
And when I say poor, I mean, do you guys remember an outside toilet? Where we'd have to walk 20 meters down. Yeah, but it's different in the Philippines. I'm talking about Merthyr Tidville. <laughs> you go 20 meters down the garden for a poo and it's freezing cold. And, and your toilet is a wooden shelf with a hole in it. And my job was to cut up the newspapers to hang them on the butcher's hook. And my grandfather came home drunk one night from the Merthyr Labour Club. And he said, have you been to the toilet? I said, yes, Willie. And Turn, turn round. And he pulled my I said, what are you doing pulling my trousers and pants down? He said, I want to read the sports page. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> so Joe and I are going through all of this. And, uh, and Joe started homing in on how I dealt with the illness. So I said, what's going on, Joe? And he said, in a strong Belfast accent, he says, geez, Martin, he says, there's only one reason you're still fucking alive. Mm. And I said, why, why is that, Joe? He said, because the devil couldn't handle the competition, he said. <laughs> and I'm relaying this story to the publisher. Uh, and I hadn't finished, I hadn't finished this then. And they are very good at fact-finding you and asking questions. And I'm relaying the story to her. And she says, wait. She said, March, she said, uh, that's the title for your book. I said, no, I got the title for the book. It's probably, no, 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 no. She said, get this kid's book out of the way now. We want the other book. And I said, I don't, no one's going to want an autobiography. She said, listen to me, I'm American. Most Americans don't have a passport. You've worked all over the world. You've spoke all over the world. You've, you've been on lovely conventions with companies. You know, I've been great places, you know. And he said, she said, people will want to read about that. And I thought, oh, I'm not so sure. And I wasn't. And then I know I've got to mention the China Bear again. I'm having a beer with Simon one night in the China Bear. Simon knows Merthyr. And he, he wrote a brilliant forward for my book. <coughs> And he said something which resonated with me when he said, when you talk about Merthyr, I can smell the coal. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was a coal miner. And our cellar had coal delivered, you know, once a month free. And I thought, wow. And he does all these outdoor things, you know. I'm, I'm far too cool for hand gliding and potholing <laughs> and caving and all that stuff. I, I, I leave that to the older guys. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> we're in the book. And he started asking questions about my mum. And... I didn't think this was interesting. But then I said, oh, I'll tell you one experience, Simon. I said, during the day, my mum was the police cook. At the evening, she worked in the local golden kitchen, which was takeaway fish and chips. Very hard working lady, N not a good education. So she had to use her brains. And, <coughs> and what would happen, the men would be fighting in Merthyr every night. And they're covered in blood. They'd go into my mum, she'd patch them up and get them all ready, some would have to go in an ambulance. But the next morning, she'd be cooking them breakfast in the police cells. So I'm out in the Vulcan pub one night, and, and I'm with a, a lady from Bedlinog, right? It's an interesting town. And uh, <coughs> so I'm, I'm sat in the bar with Julie, and she says, you're in trouble. And I said, why? And I'm about 18, I'm in college, Merthyr College of Knowledge. And she said, there's a bunch of boys here from Bed Linog and one of them likes me. I said, well, I like you. She said, you don't understand. They're going to go for you. And I said, looked at them and I thought, because I was doing karate then. I was entering competitions. I mean, I wasn't winning, but I made the team. <laughs> <coughs> and I looked over at these boys and I thought, I could take any one of those on their own. Anyone. But I can't take six. And I, I wasn't scared. I really wasn't scared until I said, come on, let's go then. And they started to follow me. And I'm walking out, and one of the hardest guys in Merthyr is right in front of me. And I looked up at him, and he said, are you Pat's boy? And I thought, that was the night I discovered adrenaline was brown. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I'm, I'm Pat's boy. And he looked at the others, and he said, go. And they went. And at that point, Simon said to me, are you Pat's boy? That's a chapter. And he knocked me off the log. And I thought, I am going to write this book because my mother was interested, my grandparents were interested, my friends, my family, people I've met have all been you know, really interested. So I'm going to write the book. And once that's out of the way, I'm going to interview Jack. And his will carry an adult warning. <laughs> <coughs> uh, so you won't want your kids to read that. But, you know, Merthyr was like that. And I can remember a certain policeman once telling me, and he's from Swansea. And he said, he said, Merthyr, he said, are you from Merthyr? I said, yes, didn't I, John? And he said, we used to send the bad cops up to Merthyr for punishment, he said. <laughs> so <coughs> so that's, that's the next step. Now, <coughs> I want to close. I want to close 
with, if you don't mind, as this is being recorded, I want to close with a nice message to Skylar, Chanel and Tiana. Is that okay? <coughs> so, one of my heroes of the 80s was Dennis Waitley. And Dennis Waitley spoke a lot about the psychology of winning. He wrote the great best-selling book, The Seeds of Greatness. And he had probably had the biggest influence on me in my life. And <clears throat> the guy really, if I read this stuff now when I feel low, and I do feel low, I mean, I'm in a bad position right now. And you know, most mornings I wake up, particularly in chemotherapy, I don't want to do anything. So I need this inspiration, this in that book. And it does work for me and it gets me going. And <clears throat> Dennis Waitley used to talk about the winners, not the whiners. Winners come in fourth exhausted, but exhilarated because they come in fifth last time. Losers see icy streets, winners put on their ice skates. Losers let it happen, winners make it happen. And he also says, there never was a winner that didn't win in advance. That every gold medalist has touched the medal, he's seen him or her win it. And he said, think about Neil Armstrong, because you can learn this. He said, Neil Armstrong, we all know the first words he said when he put foot on the moon. He said, one small step for man, you know the rest. What was the second thing he said? He said, he did. <laughs> Are you granddad? <coughs> the second thing he said was, just like drill, just like drill. They had practiced in conditions that they didn't know existed about what it would be like, and they saw in advance everything that would happen. So I'm going <coughs> to close by introducing you to my little buddy up there, R2D2, are you me too? My self image. And I want R2D2 to <coughs> look at my beautiful granddaughters. And you can tell they're beautiful. I'm good at producing granddaughters. If any of you need help, come and see me. I'm the man. <laughs> I, I can produce great granddaughters. And a robot looks at the girls and he says this <coughs> He says, Hi, I'm glad I'm me. Given my parents and my background, I can try new things. And if things don't work out, I just keep on trying. And the robot finishes as I finish. Girls, you can be a total winner, even if you're a beginner. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. Raise that C up to an A. Get in that school play if you think you can. It's not your talent or a gifted birth. It's not your bank book that determines worth. It isn't even the colour or the texture of your skin. It's your attitude that makes you win. You can wear the gold medallion, you can ride your own black stallion, you can profit through inflation, you can redirect this nation if you think you can. It doesn't matter if you won before. Makes no difference what's the halftime score. It's never over till the final gun. Is there one? You keep on trying, you'll find you've won. Now grab your dream and then believe it. Get out to work, you'll achieve it. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can, you can. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Martin. So we're going to ask a few questions now. I'll start off with perhaps a couple. Sure. And then I'm going to pass the mic round as you ask questions. So my first question would be, why porridge with honey? What was the thinking behind the title? Ah, you need to read the book. I have read the book. I have re I've read it. I've read it, honest. <laughs> no, I have read the book. But it, mm. I think I wanted, this is slushy, but I'm a granddad. Yeah. I wanted the porridge to be the thing that warms them up, warms their soul, okay. and the honey to be the sweetness in their life. Okay, nice. Do you want, nice. Have you got a bucket for John? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not for his head, but over his head. <laughs> well, he's covered his face well. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so that was my first question. The book, just as a reminder to everybody, is on sale here today for $150, and uh, Martin will do a personal dedication to you in the book if you fancy buying it. I have read it and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank Brilliant. You. And I read it very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Even you. John has read it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so my final question for you is the second book. When will it, when will it come? It's not quite finished. Uh, okay. I've got all the, all the material together and I'm not going to make the mistake I made with this one. One of the things I say in, in Porridge with Honey is don't chase two rabbits, they'll both get away. Once Simon, Joe and the others got me focused on the second book, I started writing that and I nearly lost both. So I made a decision with this. I said, I'm doing no more work 
on the devil doesn't want the competition till this is finished and I finished that within two weeks so I would say I'm probably four months away three four months of getting it published cool. well I look forward to that Thanks. very very much you're in it what? some of you some of you may <laughs> want to consult your lawyers <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, <coughs> right on to questions just put your hand up if you have a question where did you get that shirt <laughs> and that question comes from John Morgan. Where did you get the shirt? <laughs> they don't do children's sizes, but I got it from Sarah. <laughs> you robbed the bloody um, seat down on Caswell Bay. <laughs> John said some expletives. <laughs> Sarah, did you have a question? No, I didn't have a question. I was just, just going to say it's really nice because it's more like a reference book. You can just yeah. dip in and out. You don't have to read it from front to back. Very definitely, yeah. yeah. It's, and it's just a, yeah. a go-to in life. You That's know? it. You read it once through and then I think as your granddaughters will do, they'll just dip into yeah. it for the rest of their lives, won't they? Well, one of the things I didn't cover in the talk was some of the chapters. And there's a, I'm, I'm a dreamer. And there's lots in there about dreams and vision and goal setting. Goal setting, so old hat. But I focus a lot on the obstacles because I believe if you remove the obstacles from your goal, what's in your way? You've got the goal. So we talk about strategies in there. There's one thing um, I've helped some of my family with some uh, mental issues and anxiety and depression. And there's a chapter in there called Monster Me, the, the mental horror movies you play in your head and things like that. There's another section where I want the girls to walk tall, feel good. And it's called Clippity Clop, Clippity Clop. But my favorite chapter in there is the final chapter. This is Tomorrow Call In, which is a call to action. And it starts off with, right sassy princess, let's go do this babes. And we pull the whole book together. And it's like a charge, that's, that's the chapter I love. In fact, believe it or not, uh, <coughs> Gestapo man cried when he read that. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> then you lied yeah, again. <laughs> Okay, Jack, it's your chance to get your own back. Have you got any questions? I, I do. I, um, right. Oh, I better have a drink for this. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Fill me up, will you? So, uh, so Martin. Yeah. What do I do? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, Martin, uh, you introduced me to Mui Wo. Yeah. You introduced me to many good people, most of you here in the room. Uh, you introduced me to Simon. But I, I just want to know, what, how did you end up in Mui Wo? Good question. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, when I was in chemotherapy, the oncologist advised me to get off Hong Kong Island and to move somewhere with less polluted. And the first time I came here, I didn't like it. I looked around, I found it a little bit dated, and I thought, it's not for me. But the first guy I met was Nate. And then I met others, and then they told me there was this crazy policeman here from Wales. And, and then, I discovered, then I discovered a community. And now I love it. I live five minutes from the beach, five minutes from the jungle, and I love it. I mean, I, I get so many messages, honestly, just checking in on me, see how I am. And the amount of people that want to, I mean, Elaine's cooking for me. She's giving me all these creams and ointments. She's, she's like my nurse. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, p people are very caring. And I don't think I could get that in Hong Kong Island. In fact, this, this, this community, probably the only time I felt a close community, probably since my childhood days. So I'm going to cut all that bit out of the uh, final video, um, <laughs> just because we don't want people coming here. <laughs> we don't want to know about <laughs> Yeah, so. Just put in there, it's rubbish. Yeah, exactly. Moi Wa is a pit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, can I tell you something very quickly? Uh, not last Christmas, Christmas before I go home. And one of my friends said to me in the local bar, what's it like then living in uh, Hong Kong? And my youngest son, Jack, jumped in. And he said, oh, my dad's not in Hong Kong. He's in Mui Wo. <laughs> and he said, he, he lives five minutes from the beach. He said, Ev everybody's friendly, he said. He said, I arrived one night from the airport. We went straight to the China Bear. And on the way home, he said, it, it was your wife, John. He said, these Filipino girls, he said, and some of them were quite old. They had a barbecue. <laughs> Not, not yours, now? not yours, not yours. <laughs> and he said, they called us in. He said, I don't know these girls from Adam. They called me and he said, Dad, they didn't have a lot. They gave me all the food I wanted, the booze I wanted. We never made it back to the China Bear. And he said to me, those girls don't know me. And they called me in. And, and, and some of those girls were 70 plus, And they were great company, all Filipino girls. 
And Jack said, I've never experienced this, ever. <coughs> and now, when my boys come, all they ask for is a key and an octopus card. They've made their, they've made their own friends. No, I'm serious. Uh, Daniel goes to the gym quite often with Kev Reed, who's a boxer. Jack's made his own friends. So. Venus <laughs> 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 <Thinus> is crying. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm going outside for a smoke, but I, I have not a question, mm -hmm. I do remember. Again. Do, do, do How is it out? possible mm -hmm. for a man to be fast asleep while sitting bolt upright in a chair on a bench <coughs> outside a post office <laughs> and not have his mobile phone. True. Answer please on a postcard, Martin. <laughs> True. <laughs> Do you want to hear that? Tell a story. Do you want to hear it quickly? Go on then. We'll have that as a last story. Yeah. Uh, I'd done something very stupid. I was in um, injection chemo, which is horrible. And that night I had a drink. Not a lot, but it doesn't take much when you've got that poison in your body to send you to the top. So I start walking home and I get as far as the post stop by your house. And I'm sat on the bench and I fell asleep upright. And he comes, and it's late at night, he comes screeching in on the brakes on his bike and s swearing at me in Welsh. <laughs> and he said, what are you, I'll take you home. I said, no, no, buddy, I'm all right, I'm okay. I'm just really drawn and tired. Are you drunk? I said, I'm not drunk, I'm really drawn and tired. And he, he pulled up, he sat next to me, got his bag out and brought out two cans of beer. <laughs> <laughs> two cans of Versailles, but I got home. I can't remember how, but I got home. But that's the community. Yeah, emergency help yeah. is always there, isn't it? <laughs> 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 it's never far away. <laughs> yeah. But can you Even imagine, please help but you, uh, is this still on? Video? Yes, it is, yeah. Can, can yeah. you imagine for the listeners, I walk home along a beach, and I've got to get past a herd of buffaloes. <laughs> Simon's got them coming down his garden. <laughs> buffaloes walk, and to see buffaloes walking up a river, a herd of them, it's, it's a beautiful sight. Trying to get home past Joe Lauder's house is almost impossible. <laughs> he had me again this week. His hospitality is fantastic, you know. If it's morning, come and have a coffee. And before you know it, Novi's knocked up a breakfast for me. <laughs> if, it's, if it's evening, yeah. <coughs> if it's evening, it's coming come for a glass of wine. And of wine <laughs> 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 okay, good. Any last questions? Okay, we're going to wrap it up there then. And just to say, Martin, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Very engaging. Thank you. Thank you.